So this, this session is uh, entitled De-Identification of Genomic Data. So I'm, I'm Brad Mallon and I'm your host for today. Um, so I'm actually chairing the session and I'm speaking in the session. So I guess I have to introduce myself. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, so I'm, I'm as, as I said, I'm, I'm Brad Mallon. Uh, I'm at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. So uh, I'm in two departments down there. I'm, I'm an assistant professor in the School of Medicine uh, and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Engineering, uh, specifically with computer science. And uh, my background is both in computer science, but also, it's in computer science, but it's also in molecular biology and public policy. So a lot of the work that, that my group's done for the last couple of years and is, is really trying to merge all of these concepts and try to construct solutions or analyses that are relevant to, to the real world. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit of an introduction into the panel itself and not so much talk about specific developments uh, on a particular topic. Um, the three of us, it turns out, uh, recently wrote a, a book chapter on uh, challenges for privacy and clinical genomics research, specifically in the context of data mining. So I, I was going to give you a little bit of an idea of how we think about things, where the field is going, uh, and where the, field's ha where, where the field has been, and, and these guys will tell you a little bit more about specific topics when we get into them. Uh, so, so that's why the title of this is Surveying the Landscape of Privacy and Clinical Genomics Research Databases. It's meant to be a survey. Um, okay, so here's a, here's a little start. Uh, first of all, let me ask a question. How many people were at EHIP a couple years ago? I think maybe two years ago when I spoke there. So Don was there. So some of these slides will be a little bit repetitive for you. So enjoy. Um, <laughs> so a lot of people always ask me, like, why are you at Vanderbilt? So this is why I'm at Vanderbilt. Um, so Vanderbilt created uh, a DNA data bank that is tied to their electronic medical record system. Uh, and it's, it's one of the largest in the world. It's continuously growing. Uh, currently, we, we've got about uh, 100,000 individuals who have been, uh, had, their, had their blood samples uh, taken and have been tied to a de-identified repository of all the clinical information that Vanderbilt's been collecting over the years. So they significantly care about privacy for various reasons, um, as I'll go into in a second. Um, a, a little bit idea, a little bit of an uh, example of what exactly is going on at Vanderbilt. Basically, we, we've got a homegrown electronic medical record system that, that we've been pumping information into for about 15 years. Um, Vanderbilt's even spun off a company based on our electronic medical record system. Uh, it currently has about 80 million entries on about 1.5 million patients. Uh, it is completely distributed across the types of information that we're dealing with. So we've got clinical notes, we've got um, uh, patient order entry reports, we've got things that are in standardized terminologies because we've got billers that are just reading the, the discharge notes. Uh, so things like ICD-9 codes, CPTs, SNOMEDs, uh, and we've got all these test results. So that's basically what we're working with in terms of clinical information. Um, and then what we're doing is we're collecting discarded blood samples on the order of about 50,000 per year. And, and Vanderbilt works on the context of an, an opt-out environment. All right? so, so we basically give people the ability to step out of the system if they, if they want to. Uh, this is different than the opt-in type of environment that a lot of people will advocate for. Um, I am not an ethicist and I'm not going to proclaim to be and I'm not going to talk about which model is going to be better. I'm just giving you an example of what goes on at our institution. Um, so we've got these discarded blood samples that we get in the outpatient setting. Uh, and what we do is we de-identify all the electronic medical record systems. So we've got these de-identified longitudinal clinical profiles. Uh, and then we are extracting and sequencing DNA. For the most part, we're, we're doing genome-wide studies. So about 600,000 little snippets of DNA are, are being sequenced for certain individuals. Uh, and then what we're doing is what's called a genome-wide association study. So we look for particular features in the clinical record that correlate with, with uh, particular DNA variants. Right? All right. So um, the de-identification process, to give you an idea of how this works, um, what Vanderbilt did was they purchased a system before I got there that was created by a company called, well, DID. 
Uh, and, and so they license this software. And what DID does is it, it removes all these features, uh, these things like names, it removes geographical places, it removes dates, it removes all these other identifiers that HIPAA tells you you need to de-identify, need to remove in order to adhere to what would be called the safe harbor policy. So I'm not making any claims that this is safe harbor data, I'm just saying that these are the features that we remove in order to create a de-identified system. Um, so what you end up with is something like this, if you wanted to work with the system. So you get a de-identified medical record. I don't think you can see this in the back, and, and I apologize. Uh, but you get things like uh, the removed medical record numbers. Uh, social security numbers and phone numbers get replaced because we found that people like to see what was the structure of what was there. Um, we take names and we substitute them for, for fake names. Um, we do this consistently. Um, and the main reason why we do consistency is that if you want to know if a physician followed up with this record uh, or, or you want to, to know if the physician was referred to twice or if the patient was being referred to versus a family member. Um, now, we don't do this across records, so you can't track the same physician across patients. This is only for internally within a record. Um, and then for the record, we also shift dates. This is a little different than what you see in terms of HIPAA, which says that you have to remove dates. What we do is we shift dates within a 365-day window, randomly select a, an offset, and that's what you shift it for. Again, this is only done per record. So you can't do large-scale epidemiological studies. You can only do temporal studies with respect to a particular patient. OK, here's the problem with de-identified data. It's de-identified. It's not anonymous. Right? So the example that I like to use is if it says something like the mayor's wife of the largest city in the state of Tennessee. This is not something that would be removed by just about any de-identification tool that's on the market in a commercial system or has been developed by any of the medical informatics um, uh, shops across the world. Um, so you, you can end up with these very sensitive or potentially identifying features that, uh, that could allow for the re-identification of that record if an individual had the proper background knowledge. Uh, so what goes on at Vanderbilt is we use both a combination of technology and policy. So this data bank is restricted to Vanderbilt employees only. It is not a public resource. Let me repeat, it is not a public resource. These are people that the university believes they can trust. They sign use agreements when they get access to this information. Um, so in those use agreements, it says that I will not attempt to re-identify any of these individuals if I find anything wrong with the system, the de-identification tool. If for some reason identifiers were retained in the sample, for instance, then I would come back to you and let you know that and we'll make the system better. Um, again, since, since this is a restricted access system, you actually have to go through two levels of approval in order to use it. You have to go through an operations advisory board, and this is in, a, in, in addition to the institutional review board, which uh, up here would be a research ethics board. Um, and the operations advisory board actually approves projects on a case-by-case -case basis. So even if the same investigator comes in and says, I want to study glaucoma, and now I want to study myocardial infarction, he's going to get two different project numbers. And every time he uses the system, he's going to have to use that specific number so that we can track what he's doing and we can audit him to make sure that what he's doing with the system is in association with what he said he was going to do. So for instance, if somebody comes in and says, I want to do a study on neonatals, and he's looking at people who are 90 years old, there may be a problem. OK, so here's a little thing. Vanderbilt system was originally developed under institutional funds. So we developed it all by ourselves. We controlled the whole system. We restricted access to the system. Well, the National Institutes of Health decided, this is a really cool thing. So we're going to start funding studies that are going to uh, do genome-wide association studies with information derived from the electronic medical record. And so lo and behold, this is where the electronic medical records and genomics project came from. So this started about two years ago. Um, my group runs the privacy shop for this network. Um, there's five different consortium members. Uh, there's Vanderbilt University's Medical Center, Northwestern University's Medical Center, the Mayo Clinic, Group Health of Puget Sound, up in, uh, which is tied to the University of Washington, and the Marshfield Clinic. Uh, 
And all of them are doing uh, these genome-wide association studies with a different clinical phenotype that's been extracted from their medical record systems. Um, it's about 3,000 patients per study being done. Uh, now, here's the tricky part. The conditions of funding from the NIH is that you have to contribute any of the information that you generate or use to substantiate what you've, uh, what you've published in terms of findings, uh, at, you have to give that to the NIH, basically. You have to put that in a repository called dbGaP. You don't necessarily have to give them the entire EMR. You're not going to give them the entire EMR. The NIH doesn't want the entire EMR, but you have to give them whatever you use to substantiate your findings. Um, so uh, I stole this study. Uh, no, I did not steal this slide. Uh, hold on. Okay, so, so the GWAS policy goes as follows. The NIH had a GWAS policy, and, and they published this. It's, it's now under re-review. Laura, correct me if I'm mistaken. Um, basically, uh, they say that you have to remove these identifiers uh, similar to the types of identifiers you, you have to remove in HIPAA. It doesn't exactly point to HIPAA, but that's, it, it's debatable of, of its relationship. Um, you, you have to kind of give a certification that says the identities of these patients that you're sharing information on cannot be readily ascertained. Uh, and you also have to attest to the fact that, that you have no prior knowledge that the information that you are sharing could be used to, an ident to identify a subject. Um, and so this was, this was part of the policy that was, that was promulgated back in 2007. Um, now, just to give you an idea of what HIPAA and the safe harbor or the, these features are. So safe harbor uh, is basically the, the typical de-identification standard that most people in, in the U.S. apply. Basically says that you've got to remove, you know, 18 identifiers, as I said, like names, dates, things like that. It also says you've got to remove these other things, like biometric identifiers, uh, finger and voice prints are, are within there, and it has this really esoteric thing that says any other unique identifying number, characteristic, or code. Um, for the most part, people don't take that to mean genomic data because it's not a specific code that could be readily reversed to reveal an individual's identity. That's not one of those trusted third-party linking features that they've added so that you could go back and recontact a patient. Um, now, now, the question, though, is, you know, well, now we've got to share DNA. We've got to share all of these single nucleotide polymorphisms. Is that a concern? Well, I'll start by saying, so back in 2004, um, Jen Lin, Art Owen, and Russ Altman at, at Stanford had did this, this little study that was published in Science that said, you know, you really only need about 75 SNPs to uniquely identify an individual in the population, of the entire world. Genome-wide association studies use about 600,000 SNPs. So, well, people are probably going to be uniquely identifiable. Um, so, if, uh, Fred Bieber brought this up this morning. He put up the, almost the exact same slide. Um, this is a study that was recently published um, by, a, by a private company called TGen, uh, out of, and, and mainly by David Craig's group. Uh, that, that basically said that the information that was being published on dbGaP in an aggregated form, things that had been assumed to be private, uh, well, it's probably not as private as we thought it was. Now, there ended up being a lot of headlines that were published, so there was some negative press. Um, the, the Los Angeles Times said the DNA databases were going to be blocked from the public because the NIH decided, well, we're going to pull all this aggregated results offline. So. Um, so other people said, well, this is good for cops, bad for the NIH, uh, because, well, people who subpoena the records are going to be able to use it, and nobody else is going to be able to use it. Uh, or or this, this my, my favorite one, which was, forensic breakthrough stirs NIH to close GWAS data from public view. It's not that it was closed from public view, it was just that it was removed off of the front page of the site. You know, it's kind of like saying, I'm, I'm not going to, like, show you something that I know is readily identifiable. But if you want to use it, you're more than welcome to come in. Um, oh, sorry, that one I stole from Laura. This one I also stole from Laura. Uh, the, the access to dbGaP tends to be a, a, a two-tiered process. Um, basically, they, first of all, they get all this information, this genotype and phenotype data, uh, and, and what they do is they create two levels of information. So there's the public access information, which is, which is like the, you get the study information, the protocol that was used to collect the data, some descriptive statistics or description about the system, 
uh, and some general information. And then behind this, this what you might call a firewall, you get all the coded data, the genotypes, the phenotypes, and, and what the information was already used for, so some, some pre-computed statistics. Um, and so to get access to this data, uh, you basically have to submit a, 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 a research request that's got to go to a data access committee. That data access committee is then going to determine if you get access to this information. Okay, uh, so here's one thing I'd like to say. People fear what they don't understand. And so when this publication came out, a lot of people just started writing articles like crazy. You know, and they really started criticizing the NIH. They're like, oh my god, you're leaving everything in an identifiable state. DNA, it's going to be used to identify people, and the whole world is coming down. It was chicken little all over again. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of what actually happened with this attack. And, and this is a simplified form. Don't try to take this home and replicate it, because it's not exactly how they did the attack. I'm just simplifying the process. Here's what happened. You as the adversary or the attacker, you already need to know the identity of this individual in order to complete this attack. So assuming you know the person and assuming that you know the SNP variants associated with this individual, uh, I'm only going to use a single SNP variant here, normally there would be two, um, but assuming that you know these, then what you can do is you can go to the database that was at dbGaP, which was publishing aggregated correlation statistics between each SNP and the outcome variable, so a clinical variable. For instance, it might say positive cases would have diabetes, negative cases had no diabetes. What they would do is a two-tiered prediction. First thing they would do is go to publicly available population estimates, which are, for the most part, they would use something known as HapMap. Okay? Now, HapMap would tell them what the general population, various ethnicities, what, what their SNPs would look like. And so you would be able to do a comparison between what was in dbGaP in the aggregate and what was in the general population. And you would be able to determine if that person was in the population or dbGaP. Okay, that's the first step. If you can't rule out that they are in the data set as opposed to the population, you would move into this next step that would say, okay, I'm going to compare each record to each of these classes or the summary probabilities in each of these classes. And so in this situation, I'm showing that, okay, well, maybe John relates to this positive class with a much greater certainty than this clinical, th this negative class. Uh, and Bob would relate to this clinical class, this negative clinical class, at a much greater rate than the positive class. Okay? Kind of makes sense, hopefully. Um, now, let me just say another thing about the way I feel about re-identification and how people talk about it. Um, this, this is what I would call uh, an attribute disclosure. This is where the individual already knows the identity of the individual. They went through all this trouble of sequencing this data, and now they're going to try and find out some additional piece of information. Um, so that's the attribute, or this clinical class. Um, so the person already knew the identity, and now it's a re revelation of the attribute. Um, when we talk about the compromise of anonymity, which tends to be what a lot of people are concerned with, we are usually talking about what's known as identity disclosure. And in the context of identity disclosure, what we've got is some de-identified sensitive information, which is the DNA. It might be unique, maybe the clinical features. But we have to have some other identified data set, right? So in that situation, we assume that guy had identified data to begin with. Um, now, both of these features have to be relatively unique to begin with in order to establish this relationship. So I showed you that DNA is pretty unique. Um, Identified data in the U.S. can exist in a lot of different forms, right? So people talk about voter registration lists, they talk about property assessment records, they talk about lots of other things. Now, if all I showed you was de-identified DNA, and I showed you a list of individuals' names who own houses, right? There's no relationship between those two pieces of information. I have not completed a re-identification by any stretch of the means. The re-identification happens when there ends up being some common feature involved. Right? So in that previous attack, the guy used the DNA. Right? Well, what happens if you don't have like, the DNA on a particular individual? In that situation, you're kind of stuck. All right, so um, the most famous case of this type of a, a linkage attack or a re-identification attack uh, transpired back in the 1990s. This is, this is known as the William Weld attack that was done by uh, Latanya Sweeney, which basically showed that publicly available discharge data, this was pre-HIPAA, um, publicly available discharge data 
could be linked with publicly available voter registration data that was identified. All right? And you could use basically the zip code, the birth date, and the gender to pinpoint an individual. And the reason why this was called the William Weld attack was because in the 1990s, William Weld was the governor of the state of Massachusetts. He ended up having a violent reaction while on stage. He threw up, he passed out, nobody knew what went wrong with him. And what ended up happening was, well, Latanya went off and said, well, I know he's in the discharge data. Uh, and I know that there were not many people that were living in his area of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Could I use this type of information to identify him? And lo and behold, she could. Um, well, it also turned out that you couldn't just identify this guy. If you used those features, approximately 87% of the U.S. was estimated to be unique. Um, there, are, there are some contentions with this number. Some people say it could be really 65% doesn't matter. We're still talking about a whole boatload of people. Okay, so this is re-identification in its most basic essence. Um, I'll also say that this is kind of where Safe Harbor came from. Uh, this is one of the reasons why Safe Harbor said, hey, you can't have zip codes because that was used in that re-identification attack. Hey, you can't have dates because that was used in that re-identification attack. So this enumerated list that HIPAA came up with was kind of this ad hoc model of saying, these are all the features that we think could be used. Um, now, it turns out, though, that there are other ways in which you could re-identify DNA that is being used in the clinical context. So, for instance, the, the most simple way that we had come up with, this was, this was back around 2000, was we showed that there were relationships between uh, the types of mutations that you would see in uh, Mendelian disorders and the uh, clinical codes that would be published in a, a discharge record. Okay. Um, and so, for instance, 3334 here, the, in the discharge record, uh, 3334 pertains to Huntington's disease. And so if we look at the DNA data bank, if we find a CAG repeat mutation in the HD gene, we know that this could be the same individual. Could be. We don't necessarily know it is the same individual, but we know how to establish a relationship that nobody had expected us to do so before. Um, so we've got um, one method by which we're calling genotype phenotype inference. Turns out that there's other ways in which genomic information could be shared. All right. So the way in which Deco Genomics uh, was doing their research, both both in uh, Iceland and in the U.S., was they would be using pedigree information. They would be looking at family structures, um, you know, like these types of things. Like so, this guy he had the disease. This guy he uh, he uh, he died, but he didn't have the disease. Uh, here's a woman that had the disease, right? Uh, so this is like a, a two-generation pedigree structure. Um, the question that we were asking at, at the, this time, this was a couple years ago, uh, we said, well, to what extent could I re-identify pedigree information that's tied to genomic data using publicly available records again? Um, and it turns out that if you go to um, obituaries, online obituaries or online newspapers, they are quite informative with respect to the family. Um, so what I'm showing you here is, a, is an example of a guy who died in Cheyenne, Wyoming back in 2007. Um, so if you read this, if you can read it from the back, it basically says that uh, he's got two sons, he's survived by two sons, he's survived by seven daughters, we've got all their names, um, we know where they live, um, we know that uh, he had 25 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. But wait, there's more. Uh, we've, he's got an additional two daughters who died before him. He's got two brothers. Basically, I'm showing you that it, it's highly rich information. Now, we, we did a study um, back in 2006 that showed that if you just used two generation pedigree data in certain cities, in certain large cities around the country, in the U.S., that you could get upwards of 70% identifiability with respect to families using nothing more than publicly available obituary information. Um, so it turns out also that people are transient. Um, and so even if you can't establish a relationship between the DNA or between a pedigree, between a family piece, uh, um, um, a familial structure, that you, DNA itself, again, is relatively static. And if it gets collected and reused at multiple environments, which is starting to transpire where the DNA gets shared from one institution to another institution to do research, and they share that information independently, the patterns of locations that these pieces of information show up are highly unique. Well, if you look at the discharge records, 
and you have the identities in which to trace again, that these patterns end up being eerily similar to the DNA patterns. And you can establish a relationship that way. This is known as the trails attack. Um, so most recently, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to show that there's lots of ways in which we, we end up breaking the system. Um, so most recently, we, we published on, on what would be known as, a, I'm calling it an insider attack which is that even if you had de-identified information, like no demographics, uh, with no demographics, um, and all you had was data that was in the electronic medical record system, for instance, the diagnosis code, turns out that the combination of diagnosis codes are highly unique for individuals as well. Um, so we, we looked at, at Vanderbilt, the Vanderbilt 1.5 million population, and about 50% of them that had at least one diagnosis code were unique in their combination of codes. Um, about 75% of them, the ones that had two or more codes, uh, the ones that had two or more codes were 75% unique. All right. Um, we actually just published this uh, yesterday, uh, and and I'm going to pat myself on the back. Uh, we ended up winning a, a best paper award at at the medical informatics uh, uh, conference earlier in the week because we we showed that uh, if you took a particular GWAS study, uh, the one that Vanderbilt is is currently doing and you look at their diagnosis codes, and you look at them in the context of that entire 1.5 million population, they are about 97% unique. So we call that an insider attack because you gotta have access to the diagnosis codes to begin with. But it turns out that if you use the diagnosis codes that would only be available in the dis discharge records themselves that were public, again, it's on the order of about 90 to 95% unique. All right, so um, is all hope lost? I'm going to say no, even though I just said otherwise. Should we just give up? Well, if, if all hope is lost, then yes, but I'm going to say again, no. Um, I, I, I truly believe that there are ways to protect data, and, and Marat and Chris are going to talk about this a little bit more. Um, but to do so, I, I really believe that it's a process. There is no single bullet that actually protects information. Um, I, I think it requires threat modeling. I think it requires knowing who has access to information or trying to understand what access they would have, as well as what the hell they're going to do with the data. Um, it, it requires some amount of access control. I'm not just going to put all this information online and allow everybody to access it. Uh, and it requires some amount of disclosure control. And, and what exactly is that? Well, I'll, I'll show you in a second. But disclosure control is kind of this, this field in which you determine how to suppress or generalize or obscure certain pieces of information, leaving it useful for certain research purposes or validation purposes, but uh, uh, preventing the, uh, the, the linkage of that information for re-identification purposes. Um, so just, just an idea of how this tends to work um, generalization of, of EMR coded data or, or diagnosis codes, um, you can do things like, like truncating the codes by one digit, which is similar to a, um, it, it's just a generalization of, of the code because the ICD-9 codes have a typical coding hierarchy. So instead of it being the most specific thing like broken left toenail, it might say broken toenail. Or instead of saying diabetes mellitus uh, with, with nonspecific complications, it might just say diabetes mellitus. Um, and so you can end up uh, structuring the system such that the combinations of those codes are such that you can guarantee that the number of individuals in the population from whom it was derived have a particular population size, so at least 10 individuals. And then you can give that information out to researchers, at which point they may come back and say, it's not specific enough. I can't. I can't do the complete study I want to do. At which point they could come back to you and say, I want more specific information. You go, aha, well, if you want more specific information, I might regulate you at a stronger level. I might have more oversight. I might now say that I'm going to fine you. I might say that there may be punitive damages involved in this if you violate the system. Um, if I find that you violate the system, I'm not going to try and speak like a lawyer because I'm not a lawyer. Um, but it still comes back to this question of what are you supposed to do with DNA? Um, so back in 2004, that, that famous paper that showed DNA is unique through SNPs, uh, they suggested that you use something like perturbation. So in, in this system, you would, you would take the, the SNP and you would randomly flip them into some other character. 
Okay? Now, SNPs tend to have come in pairs, so it's either an A or a T, or it's either a C or a G, or a C or an A, or something. Um, and so basically, they're just flipping things randomly. And what they showed was that the more you flip, the harder it is to link the records. Duh. Right? But what they also showed was that the more you flip, the less useful that information is for research purposes. So what happened was in this paper back in 2004, in a very prestigious journal, they said anonymization doesn't work. Therefore, you should never give this data out. And, and that, was, that, was a real, that was a real strike to the heart of, of privacy advocates at the time, or data privacy advocates. Um, and so I ended up coming out with a paper back in 2005 that says, no, 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 in reality, you, you could do things like generalization. So maybe I won't report all the SNPs to you. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll report some generalized features. And, and, and I can still guarantee that I could not uh, re-identify these people, uh, but, but at least I'm not going to be falsifying the information. Um, Oh, that really came out horribly, didn't it? Okay, well, so when I'm talking about this anonymization process, I actually think that there are things like formal models that can be applied. So an example of a formal model would be something called a K-protection strategy. So one model is called K-MAP, okay? Uh, and I attribute this back to Latanya Sweeney. Uh, this is from a paper she published back in 2002. Basically, K-MAP says, uh, for every record I publish in my sample, there's going to be at least k people in that population to whom it corresponds. So in this system, I'm basically showing that it's got two map protection. So each record's got two people from which it corresponds. Um, now, a lot of people say you don't always know the population from which the data was derived. And that's where the alternative solution it came from. Several people today have mentioned this concept of k-anonymity. Um, k-anonymity basically says that enforcing the relationship between the sample and the population, you enforce it directly on the sample. You make that sample equivalent to the population. So you say that for every record in my sample, there's at least k minus one other records that are equivalent to this record. So you're basically coarsifying the data. All right, so that's a, that's a k strategy. Um, we, we've actually developed similar types of case strategies for the trails problem. Um, so in, in which we, we figure out how to deduplicate the information uh, without overly deduplicating because sometimes the geographic information helps or different geographic regions contribute different pieces of information. So it's, it's basically just an intelligence suppression strategy on the DNA. Um, notice I'm not anonymizing or I'm not messing with the the discharge records here because I don't have any control over that. I can't change the policies there. Instead, what I'm saying is that the data that is currently private, the DNA information, the clinical information that I have access to, since that's not published yet, I've got to dock my protection to what's already been published. I can't force them to retract this information. Um, so we had, we had done an example, we had done a study that uh, what we did is we took uh, cystic fibrosis patients in the, the state of Illinois. Um, we, we had a the discharge records from 1990 to 1998, and we tracked where all these um, the cystic fibrosis patients went, and we looked at their trails. For the most part, um, they, were, they were extremely unique to begin with. Um, they were on the order of like 70% in terms of their trails. And, and so basically what we showed was that uh, uh, if you did not, so actually they were 40, 41% unique. So this basically says to how big of a group size do each of these records belong, each DNA sequence. So here what you're saying is that in a group of one, 41% of the population is, is, is in there. In a group of two or less, then we've got about, well, 45%. In a group of 50 or less, we've got about 70% of this population. Uh, and if you ran our, 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 our little strategy, uh, we could guarantee that for any level K, that you would not have any re-identifications, but you could show that, for instance, at this K of two, we would still get about 97% of the samples into this repository with a formal privacy model, pri formal privacy protection. Uh, if you weren't so worried about a group of two, if you were really worried about somebody being mapped to a group of 50 or less, if that was your concern, well, then we could give you a proof that says, well, we can give you about 70% of the information. All right. Um, so. To come back to this attack that I talked about earlier, the Homer attack that got everybody freaked out, um, what's been proposed, there, there's actually been some research lately uh, coming out of UC Berkeley, Aaron Halperin's group came up with a, uh, a little probabilistic model to show the set of SNPs 
that you could disclose while being below a particular threshold of predicting which class an individual is in. Uh, it's got some deficiencies associated with it. It's not a perfect model, but at least you can give some quantification in terms of what exactly the concern is and mitigating it. Um, so I, I'm not going to talk about this. Marat's going to talk about this, but I wanted to give you another idea of how else you could manage this information. So instead of publishing aggregates or instead of just suppressing features, you could not publish anything. And instead, what you could use is the information in its most specific sense, but you encrypt all of it. And you end up running queries over encrypted pieces of information. Um, he'll talk about that. So the landscape. There exists a potential for privacy compromise. There exists multiple potentials for privacy compromise. Um, but all that means is that there are models. It doesn't mean that there are likelihoods of these things occurring. It doesn't mean that they will occur. Some of them cost a whole hell of a lot more than some of the other ones. Um, and, and not all that needs to be quantified. Um, but even in that context, there exist ways to prevent these types of threats from transpiring. All right? And we shouldn't just throw up our hands and say this doesn't work. Um, so again, I'm saying that you got to model the costs. Who's got access to the information? How much is it going to uh, uh, cost economically for them to achieve this type of attack? And, and when is it going to occur? Uh, who's going no, to do it? We already talked about that. Um, now, you also have to recognize that even though something is unique, it doesn't mean it's going to be used in a re-identification process. So a lot of people lately have been saying, look at these molecular signature studies. Look at microarray data. Look at these expression studies. Like, wow, that's highly unique. Or look at this brain image. Okay, yeah, you know what, that's unique, but if I don't have an easy way of replicating that in a different set, I can't use it for identification purposes. So trying to understand which features are replicable, replicable when you go to share data is extremely important. Otherwise, you end up making false assertions or overprotecting the data. Um, and again, uh, given these threats, they're, they're, you should use risk mitigation strategies. Now, notice I said risk. I didn't say necessarily anonymization strategies. You don't necessarily have to have a formal anonymization process. But if you characterize the system in terms of how risky it is to share data, try to bring all of this together into a formal process, then you may do a better job of you know, like bringing it to a certain level of manageability. All right, uh, so just acknowledging a couple people. Um, there's, there's a lot of people who have contributed to this work. Um, basically everybody in my lab at, at Vanderbilt, which is the Health Information Privacy Laboratory. Um, a lot of collaborators, including uh, Murat, who's going to talk. Uh, and, and we're basically funded from the National Institutes of Health to develop privacy technologies as well as do the privacy consultation service for that eMERGE network. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop there because I know I'm way over time. You guys got to stop me. Can, can we hold off questions till the end? So that, so that we haven't, I just want to make sure everybody gets there. Maybe one question. Oh, okay, Marat, tell me I should take one question. Yeah. Yeah, so, so HIPAA actually gets, let, lets me play around with this. So HIPAA has multiple de-identification models, right? One is what is the, that, that safe harbor model that I talked about. But there's another one which is called the statistical standard. And the statistical standard basically says that you are allowed to uh, share information provided that the expert certifies that the risk of identifying per, a person is sufficiently low. Now, the, the regulation is written in a highly, highly ambiguous manner, right? And it is not clear what exactly that means. But if you have a good mechanism, and you can publish that mechanism, and people vet that mechanism, then if you say I've pr protected the data in this way, and people agree on it, then I can still share the data. And it may be a risk management model, as opposed to uh, this black or white model. It turns out that that's actually what we're doing. Um, for, for the eMERGE network. Um, we've actually developed strategies that allow people to share information that are in a different way than Safe Harbor um, would allow you to do so, but it's going to require uh, some buy-in from, from the NIH as well as uh, 
uh, Health and Human Services to, to say this is something that you should do. So I, I, I'll, I'll just close by saying that um, one of the reasons why, why I work in policy in addition to medical schools is, is that I, I really do try to get people down in D.C. to care about that work. Uh, and if they don't buy into it, well, I got a problem. 